So thank you very much for, for that introduction. Uh, and you know, I'm a researcher. You guys do the hard stuff. Um, and I just try to see how, how well it works and how it can be made to work a little better. Uh, thanks also for having me and for the uh, wonderful organizers, uh, Julie and Linda and Elaine and, and all of you, and thanks, thanks for being here. So there we go. Look at that. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a, a little bit about the national study and uh, as well as a little bit about your, your local data uh, because you're a really important part of the national study. Um, and I was going to start with uh, a little bit of an overview about uh, homeless families. I also want to kind of acknowledge all the folks locally as uh, well as nationally who participated in it. And we've got people like Liz Varela and Wendy Jackson here whose agencies uh, were, were part of this study. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be able to kind of give back some of the information we've learned. Um, and I will skip over very quickly the stuff about family homelessness in the United States, uh, give you a little overview of the family option study, and then the focus uh, of the Alameda data collection was on the relationship between different service systems here in Alameda County uh, and some of the lessons learned from the study. Okay, um, here let me just uh, point out, this is the data from the National Low Income Housing Coalition. It's a couple years out of date. It's the hours per week at the local minimum wage that you have to work in different states in order to be able to afford the fair market rent for a two bedroom apartment. And the dark orange states like California, uh, three full time minimum wage jobs aren't enough to afford the fair market rent for a two bedroom apartment. You know that, but it puts you, uh, you know, the, the housing crisis and housing affordability issue in real perspective. Uh, Nan told you that homeless families were young uh, and infancy is actually the age at which you are most likely to show up in a homeless shelter in the United States. So when we think about the face of homelessness in the United States, we have to think not only about that guy on the left, but also about the child on the right. Okay, the family option study. So what this study did was to compare four different approaches to ending family homelessness. Uh, the first was a permanent housing subsidy, uh, and we abbreviate that as sub, and you'll see that abbreviation some other places, uh, which was typically a housing choice voucher, which allows families to rent housing in the private market and holds their costs to 30% of their income, with the housing authority paying the rest of that. Uh, next is community-based rapid rehousing. Nan talked a lot about uh, rapid rehousing, and uh, the rapid rehousing in the study pretty much corresponded to that. Project-based transitional housing provides some time-limited housing and extensive social services to families in supervised facilities. Um, and these different housing uh, approaches have kind of different rationales. The subsidy approaches say housing is, uh, homelessness is basically a housing affordability problem. And the transitional housing says, yeah, but in addition, families who experience homelessness have a variety of other issues that they need to address before they can really succeed in housing. Uh, and we'll help them to address some of those, those issues. And we compare all of these with usual care in the community. And it's important to say usual care is not nothing. Right? Usual care is an extensive array of uh, emergency shelter and social services uh, designed by people to try to get folks into out of homelessness and, and into housing. Um, and so we're trying to see whether uh, these other approaches can do even better than uh, the work that you're already doing to try to reduce family homelessness. Okay. We had 12 communities across the United States. Alameda County is there. Uh, altogether, there were 2,300 families in the study. We followed up 81% of them 20 months later. Alameda County was our second largest site. One in nine of the folks in the family option study were from Alameda County. Uh, it was 258 families. There were nine shelters that participated, seven transitional housing programs, three housing authorities one rapid rehousing program with a lot of sites. So Alameda County was a lot of the action um, in the family housing study. Okay. And the programs were really throughout uh, the county. Uh, Alameda County families looked a lot like the families in the rest of the study. 
Uh, so the vast majority of the adults were women. We talked to women by preference in two-parent families. Uh, and overall, uh, our families, uh, we had about a quarter of the families, uh, I'm sorry, this is the whole uh, group, we have about a quarter of the families that had uh, two parents, another uh, a little over 10% did not have a spouse or partner with them in shelter, but had a spouse or partner elsewhere. Uh, our median family income was $7,400 coming into this, so that's why families are homeless, right? 63% uh, of our families had a prior episode of homelessness, uh, and our sort of median uh, w woman was 29 year old, years old. She had one or two kids. These are, tend to be small families, tend to be fairly young families. Okay, Alameda County looks the same, uh, and there's one error here uh, that I've corrected, but if you've got the printed out versions of the slides, it's 10.5% with a partner not in shelter with them. So uh, that's wrong in anything that got printed out earlier. Um, race ethnicity in Alameda sort of mirrors the whole study because you're, uh, we, we have sites that are more one and more another and you're, you're everything um, in, in Alameda. Okay, so uh, what we tried to do is a study, an experiment. You've probably heard that random assignment is the gold standard, so I put it in yellow. Uh, the idea is that it equates the families that ex uh, have the different offers in, in the study. But we couldn't simply do random assignment because a lot of programs had criteria that families had to meet in order to get into them. The most common criteria uh, had to do that our families flunked, had to do with income and employment uh, standards. We had one transitional housing program, I think it was not in Alameda County, that asked for families to have $2,000 a month in income in order to join their program, so why are they homeless again? Uh, and uh, so what we did is we screened families for the openings that were available in the community. We randomly assigned them among the interventions for which they were eligible, because we didn't want to send them to places that we knew wouldn't take them. And then when we're comparing a particular intervention to usual care, we include only those usual care families who could have gotten into that intervention but lost the lottery, okay? Uh, and so we have kind of three mini experiments of well-matched groups of people each compared to usual care, and the report on the Hub website also shows you the comparisons among the interventions. Okay, so gaining admissions to programs was, was hard. There was the screening prior to random assignment. Transitional housing programs in particular screened out more than a quarter of families. Um, and in addition to the employment uh, and income uh, issues for transitional housing, there are unit size issues and there are family composition issues because you're going into a program and you know if you have a one bedroom unit, you can't handle a four or five you know, person family. Uh, and so uh, that, that was an issue for transitional housing. Uh, rapid rehousing and housing subsidies accepted uh, most of the families. Uh, but then what we gave families was an offer. We said, here's a program, it has an opening for you, it's expecting you to come, uh, go there. Um, and some of them did and some of them didn't, right? And uh, we found that only about half of the transitional families offered transitional housing went there. And the issue was largely uh, in qualitative data about location. Uh, so families wanted to be near uh, their kids' school and workplaces and public transportation and uh, families that could provide support and they'd always grown up in that community. Um, only about three-fifths of families got to rapid rehousing. Um, and there it was partly uh, the, what location wasn't an issue because you could use those uh, subsidies anywhere. Uh, partly it was families that didn't feel that the, it, the, that kind of temporary subsidy would help them. Partly families say that the programs rejected them more often than the programs say that they rejected the families. 84% um, of the families who got offered housing subsidies leased up, so they weren't screened out by the housing uh, authority. They got issued their vouchers. They were able to find housing in the private rental market, and it was over 90% in Alameda County. So your families were really uh, able to make use of those, those vouchers, and we've got to give a lot of credit to the housing authorities, uh, Berkeley, Alameda County, and particularly Oakland, uh, for giving those vouchers. 
Uh, we looked at five uh, domains of outcomes, and I'll talk about each of those in turn. Uh, first was housing stability. This was a study of families who were experiencing homelessness, so that was pretty key. Uh, and we found that of families in usual care, this is compared to the subsidy intervention, about a quarter told us at 20 months that they'd been homeless in the last six months. And a little over a quarter showed up in the local ha homeless management information system administrative records, which isn't complete and is local over a one-year period from seven months to 18 months. Um, and about uh, under, just under a third had been doubled up with another family because they couldn't pay the rent. So those are the sort of greenish gray bars on the right. You never know what color the projector is going to come up with. The purple bars uh, show the equivalent numbers for the families who are offered a housing subsidy. Uh, so the housing subsidies more than halved homelessness uh, by self-report, almost halved it in the administrative records, more than halved doubling up. Transitional housing led to some modest improvements um, in homelessness, not in doubling up. That was true in Alameda County for the 20 months of the study. Uh, it wasn't true when we take it out to the 30 months in your administrative record. So in, uh, the, at the 20-month point, we still had some families who were in transitional housing, but in 30 months, we didn't have an effect anymore in Alameda County. And rapid rehousing did not, uh, the offer of rapid rehousing did not improve housing stability over usual care. And again, usual care is not nothing. Usual care is uh, a lot of effort to try to get people uh, in, into housing. Um, so here's a, the quickie summary, and I won't give you more graphs here about the national study. I'll save the graphs for the local stuff. Uh, about half of our usual care families have been either homeless or doubled up recently. Uh, Sub-reduced both homelessness and doubling up by more than half. Transitional housing had some modest impact on, on homelessness during the period that families could, were still eligible for transitional housing. Rapid rehousing did not improve things over usual care. Uh, and uh, that was certainly true in Alameda County. Family preservation. So about 15% of usual care families had a child separated from the family in the past six months. Uh, and about 4% had a child placed in foster care. So the vast majority of those separations are informal separations. We'll be talking about Alameda's data on foster care placements in particular, but foster care placements, and we'll be talking about reports of child abuse and neglect, which we don't have in the overall study. Um, and so this is family self-report of whether there was a separation, whether the kids were in foster care. Uh, the housing subsidy intervention reduced those separations by two-fifths. It reduced foster care placements by three-fifths. That was true in Alameda County um, in, in spades. And rapid rehousing and transitional housing didn't have effects over and above usual care. Adult well-being. About one in seven adults in usual care at follow-up reported alcohol or drug dependency. About one in eight reported intimate partner violence. Um, and the subsidy intervention reduced dependence on alcohol and drugs by almost a third. It reduced intimate partner violence by more than half. It also had effects on psychological distress. That's a continuous measure, so I can't say, you know, by half, uh, but substantial effects. And rapid rehousing and transitional housing didn't. So that's really interesting, right? The housing intervention has more effect on the psychosocial outcomes than the heavy-duty psychosocial services have on the psychological outcomes. Okay. Uh, child well-being. Well, the biggest impact on child well-being is that family separation, right? But we, so we only know about the kids who are still with their families at follow-up. Uh, and we find that in the subsidy group, the families move schools or the kids move schools less often. Uh, both the rapid rehousing and the subsidy group had fewer absenteeism. Uh, less absenteeism, transitional housing didn't have effects. We don't have general effects on a whole slew of other uh, health and behavior outcomes for children, possibly because the kids who might have the worst outcomes, either because of their families or because of, of themselves, uh, were no longer with their families. Okay, self-sufficiency. This one looks a little different uh, from the others. Uh, so. 
Uh, first, the overall, fewer than a third of the usual care families worked for pay in the week before the follow-up survey. So we're coming out of the recession here, but we're not really fully out of, of the recession. Um, and we don't have a lot of families engaged in work. And it was even a little worse for families who got the housing subsidies. So housing subsidies do depress work a little bit. Uh, both housing subsidies and rapid rehousing increased food security. Okay, so food insecurity is the sanitized term for hunger. Um, and uh, we still have hunger among the families who got the different kinds of subsidies, but they're reduced for folks who got, got subsidies. Um, and rapid rehousing increased incomes. Uh, Percentage-wise, by a lot, another, about $1,100 annually, um, but that still doesn't bring folks up to the level that they can afford, on average, the fair market rent in many jurisdictions. Okay. Um, so, what works for whom? This is this is a really important question, and we can't tell you much about it. So, we, uh, excuse me, uh, looked at whether the interventions were more or less effective for two groups of families. Families that had a lot of psychosocial needs, uh, and that included things like substance use or PTSD, um, or more barriers to housing by self-report, and that included things like not having income to pay rent or the down payment, um, or an eviction history, or, you know, so. And what we found was the same results, basically, for families who are high and low in psychosocial challenges and high and low in housing barriers. So we'd be, love to be able to tell you, do this for these families and do that for those families. And the best evidence we have says uh, the, the results are about, not that the results for families, that, that is, some of these things do influence whether families become homeless again, but they don't tell us about whether particular ways of approaching families are more or less effective. Um, cost. So this is a little different from what Nan told you. Nan told you about the cost per episode. Of, and per episode, using rapid rehousing is a whole lot cheaper than using transitional housing, and it's cheaper than you sh uh, the, the shelter stays per, per episode. Um, but what we did here is we looked at all the costs incurred over 20 months by, in the housing and service system for families who got each of the offers. And so families who got each of the offers did a lot of things. Um, some of them did what we offered them and some of them did other things. Uh, but the groups that are equated to begin with are the groups that got the offers. And if we look at the groups who got the offers, they all used a lot of resources, about $30,000 per family over 20 months. Um, and the costs only varied about 10% from one intervention to the next. So rapid rehousing is definitely cheaper, uh, but only by about 10%, and transitional housing is more, and housing subsidies didn't cost more to the housing and service system than usual care. Okay? So that's sort of interesting. So intervention impacts in Alameda, uh, as I already told you, uh, priority access to the subsidies, reduced homelessness over 30 months, over the 30 month period. Uh, we don't have effects of transitional housing or rapid rehousing compared to usual care, which is a lot. Um, and foster care placements based on administrative records also went down for families who got the housing subsidies. Okay, so now focusing in really on Alameda County. Uh, we looked at service use by families in three different systems. Uh, income support systems, CalWORKs and CalFresh, uh, the uh, Child Protective Service System, and shelter use. And this is all based now on administrative records. Uh, we see with CalWORKs and CalFresh that on the left you have before and on the right after study entry. So uh, the homeless service system is doing a pretty good job at hooking people up to income support services. Um, you might ask, since the people got them on afterwards, they were presumably eligible for them before, uh, and they weren't getting them before, could getting more families who are eligible for these services onto services help them avoid homelessness? We don't have evidence from that, from this study, because all of our families started out homeless, and they'd all, by the way, been in shelter for at least seven days at the point we, we uh, enrolled them in the study. Um, Getting these uh, income support services didn't affect returns to shelter afterwards in, among our families, 
but at least it you know raises some questions. Um, Child Protective Services reports also went up, and I'll be saying a lot more about that. Foster care placements went up, um, and uh, there was additional use of shelter after our families were in shelter. So let's talk more about the shelter ones first, and then we'll talk about the Child Protective Services. Okay, so um, how many shelter episodes did our families have? Nan Roman told you earlier that, about Dennis Colhane's work that is, uh, did a typology and said most people are homeless once and, and only fairly briefly, and that's true in Alameda County too. Um, and fewer families have two or three uh, or more episodes of homelessness. The caveat here is that this is only homelessness that appeared in the Homelessness Management Information System, and 83 of our families didn't have a record in the Homelessness Management Information System within 30 days of the time we enrolled them in the study, even though they had to be in a shelter for a week in order to get into the study. So here as elsewhere, the Homelessness Management Information System is not complete. Um, if, since we knew they were in shelter, at the time we enrolled them, uh, if they didn't show up in administrative records then, we added one to, to their shelter count. Over on the right, we have the number of days uh, that they spent cumulatively um, in shelter from 2002 to 2014. Um, and here we left out those families that didn't show up because we didn't know how many days to add for them. We, we added an episode because we had talked to them there in shelter, but we couldn't say how many days. Um, and uh, again, families with uh, more episodes have, have more days. Um, the way that your data differs a little bit from uh, the Colhane data uh, is that uh, he only followed families for about three years, and so you couldn't have families with both multiple episodes and long stays in each of those episodes. So if you had multiple episodes, they were short, and if you, and so we've got families, you've got families that have both multiple episodes and long stays. Uh, and so uh, over a longer period, it seems like the more episodes, the more stays, rather than uh, quite the, the typology that, that Dennis has. But like uh, Colhane's work, most people are homeless once, fairly briefly. The average stay per episode in Alameda was 77 days for folks with one episode, 64 days for folks with more than one stay. That's shorter than the national average in the family options study, uh, where it was about four months for that initial shelter stay. Uh, it's shorter than Colhane's data for New York, Massachusetts, or Philadelphia, probably because he also included transitional housing and we're just looking at shelter. Uh, it's longer than for Columbus, Ohio, uh, and that's probably because housing's a little harder to find here than in Columbus, Ohio, okay? But uh, the, the key point is that most families who become homeless are, are homeless once, um, and uh, that, again, doesn't just happen. It's part of the homeless service system that you guys are, are or many of you are not part of that system, but many of you are, uh, are working with families to, to try to get them out and to get them stable. Okay, so what predicts whether families come back? So all of our families start out in this study uh, in, in the middle of an experience of homelessness. What predicts whether they come back again later after that first experience? So controlling for what kind of intervention they got, since that makes a big difference. Uh, we find that, not surprisingly, having a prior episode, that is even before they came into the study, predicts having a subsequent episode even after the study. So if the study episode is their second or third or fourth, they're more likely to have another one. Having really low incomes at study entry predicts coming back. Um, and surprisingly, lower levels of those psychosocial challenges predict uh, people coming back. You would think higher levels would but that's not how it comes out. I have no explanation for that. Factors that did not predict were whether you got onto CalWORKs at study entry, right? So it, it, these are all what at study entry predicts later coming back to shelter. Um, and reported abuse or neglect prior to study entry doesn't predict coming back. And we'll see that there is this huge intersection between the child welfare system and the homeless system, but it doesn't seem like it's the child welfare system that's causing here um, 
the additional episodes of, of homelessness. Okay.